Good evening, everybody. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 will begin there. And you can place a marker there in the book of Galatians because we're going to spend all night in that particular book. Tonight's lesson is about the differences between the Old and the New Covenant. And uh, nothing that I say is going to be new in the sense of the broad principles that I'll be presenting. But perhaps we're going to be looking at it from a different way. We're going to be looking at it from the deeper side of the Bible. We're not going to be going to the one-liners of uh, the Bible or the Old Testament uh, having its faults and fading away and being nailed to the cross. We're going to be looking at it in a fairly deep way, or at least I think it's deep. You may think it's, uh, that's old, old hat to me. I got this idea from reading a booklet recently that Mitch recommended called The Big Picture of the Bible. So if you don't like the lesson, you can blame Mitch. He, it's written by an elder in the church. I believe he lives in Alabama. And he goes about presenting the gospel um, in a way that he likes to present it to unbelievers. And he's recommending this way of, of bringing this message to, to unbelievers. And you could probably tell what the book is about, the big picture of the Bible. And so rather than looking at one-liners that we might call them, about repentance or about baptism, he kind of brings in the entire picture. For example, let's take repentance. Why repent? Well, instead of just starting with repentance and defining what that is, he starts out by telling you about a holy God who cannot stand sin. Well, if you get that, now I can understand repentance or understand why God wants me so deeply to repent because he is so holy he is so righteous, he cannot be around sin. And so, it makes sense then to repent if we're going to serve this holy God. Well, one of the things that he does about sacrifice in building the case of the necessity of the sacrifice of Jesus is he talks a lot about the Old Testament sacrifices. And I like that. And I told the elders that I like that uh, way of approaching things because it brings in the Old Testament. If you've ever studied with somebody who knows little about the Bible, the Old Testament is a huge question mark. They don't know how to handle it. I mean, you, you can go, you can present to them right off the bat that what we're trying to do is follow the New Testament, but you're, you're ignoring a bulk of the Bible. And that's a huge question mark for them about why. So let's talk about this. I'm going to start off with a, with a rather tricky question, and that is this. Were the Israelites the children of Isaac or the children of Ishmael? The Israelites, were they children? Were they descendants of Isaac or were they descendants of Ishmael? Now, you might think that that's an easy question because Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 sons. They became the, the 12 patriarchs, the, the, the heads over the tribes of Israel. So they're descendants of Isaac, right? Wrong. Allegorically, figuratively, now I, I didn't say this in the question, so it was kind of a trick question. I should have said, figuratively speaking, whose descendants are they? Allegorically, what the Bible says here in Galatians chapter 4 is that the Israelites are descendants of Hagar, Ishmael's kids. You know who the descendants of Isaac are? I'm looking at them. I'm one of them. Because I'm a child by promise, not a child by flesh. Let's begin reading the text here. In Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? I love that question because I love sarcasm. I don't love disrespectful sarcasm, but sometimes if sarcasm is respectful and not hurtful, uh, you can really punch a point in. Those of you who listen to the law, haven't you read your Bibles? Don't you know what your Bible even says? What the Old Testament law says about itself? Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Let's start putting this up on the board slowly. We're going to go just verse by verse by verse. Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman. That's the son of Hagar. That's Ishmael. And one, the son of Sarah. The son, or the free woman, he says. 
Verse 23 now. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So let's put those up now. Son of the flesh was Ishmael, and son of promise was Isaac. Now, a skeptic might say, well, wasn't Isaac also a son of the flesh? I mean, didn't, didn't Isaac literally come from Abraham? Didn't Sarah literally bear him from her physical body? Yes and no. No from the standpoint of, according to the flesh, it would have been impossible. You know what the Bible says about Abraham's body when he had Isaac? Twice, the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11, his old decrepit body was as good as dead. That's a quote. He was so old, he was so decrepit, no offense if you're aging up on 99, but his body was as good as six feet in the ground. And you know what the Bible says about Sarah's body? It's barren, desolate, that she was past the age of childbearing. So not only was she barren in her good years, but she was past the age of when it might happen. So if it's according to the flesh, or if it was up to the flesh, there's no way that Isaac would have been born. The only reason that Isaac came into this world was because God made a promise. God promised them, that they were going to have children. Okay? Verse 24. Now these may be interpreted allegorically. That is, these two women. The latter part of verse 24. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Okay, let's put that up. She, she represents Hagar and Ishmael and her children, the Israelites, represent the old covenant while Isaac represents the new covenant keep reading verse 25 now Hagar is Mount Sinai I'll put that up on the board corresponding to the physical Jerusalem the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother drop down to verse 28 now you brethren talking to the church of Jesus Christ now you brethren like Isaac are children of promise. So these Israelites are bearing children for slavery, corresponding to what is in the present Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem. She corresponded, Hagar did, to Mount Sinai, whereas we correspond to Mount Zion. Now the text doesn't say Mount Zion, but Hebrews chapter 12 does. I'm stealing that from Hebrews chapter 12. And we have a Jerusalem above, he says in Galatians chapter 4. And lastly, we're not bearing children for slavery. We're bearing children, the new covenant is, for freedom. Now, if you know the story of the Bible, you might wonder, well, how could Hagar correspond to Mount Sinai if they're all in slavery? Because you know what happened just before they got to Mount Sinai, right? They came out of slavery. So how can the, the, the people who are bearing children for slavery, how can the slave woman correspond to Mount si uh, Sinai when they had just come out of it? Well, yes, they just came out of physical slavery, but what happened at Mount Sinai was that they were entering a different kind of slavery. The kind of slavery that the law, the Old Testament law, brought. Slavery of sin which the Old Testament law could not release anybody from. Back up to chapter 3, if you will. And you'll see three times in two verses, Paul say that what the Old Testament law brought is imprisonment and captivity. He says captivity twice. Verse 22 and 23 of chapter 3, But the scripture imprisoned, there's one. The scripture did what? It imprisoned Everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 23 now. Now before faith came, we were held captive. There's the second time. We were held captive under what? Under the law. Imprisoned. There's the third time. I think I told you captivity twice, but it's actually imprisonment twice and captivity once. Imprisoned until, the, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So what the law brought at Mount Sinai and why Hagar corresponds to that is the law brought imprisonment. It brought captivity. Now you might be asking this question. 
Why does the Old Testament law bring slavery and imprisonment? Because we all break it. And every Israelite, except Jesus of Nazareth, broke it. No one could keep it perfectly. And once you were in the slavery of sin, Jesus said in John chapter 8, everyone who commits sin is what to sin? A slave of sin. You're in slavery now. And you can't get out. You cannot get out. And you can't get out by perfect law keeping after you break it. Rick used a speeding analogy from the Lord's table. By the way, Rick, you made me shudder. I'm a lead foot. And I'm working on it with my wife's help. But let's use another speeding analogy. Let's say that I'm going through a school zone at 85 miles an hour, criminal speeding. And a police officer pulls me over and he cuffs me. He takes me in wherever he's going to take me. And my defense about my criminal speeding is this. That stupid law. Is it the law's fault? It's my fault for speeding, right? Well, let's say further that I tell the judge or whoever I'm talking to, I, I promise that I won't ever speed again. Well, they let me go. If somebody assaults a person, they said, no more assault for me. I promise I'm clean. No more assault. Are they going to let me go if I've assaulted? What about murder? What about anything else? You know who uses that kind of logic is toddlers, my own son. He will do anything to get out of a spanking. He will promise the world what we like to do. He's probably coming in from a spanking right now. <laughs> <clears throat> what we like to do before we spank Judah is we sit him down and we make him tell us why he's getting the spanking. So that there is no misunderstanding about what happened and that he fully understands. Well, one of the things, you learn a lot about your child and the way they think in these conversations. One of the things that he likes to do is he, is he says, Baba, be good for the rest of the day. I'm going to be good for the rest of the day. I promise. No more of this. You know, that's the way little kids think, but I, I think that's the way adults think, religiously. That we can just make up for sin by doing good later on. Wrong. You're not going to make up for your law-breaking by law-keeping. You need a sacrifice. You need a perfect sacrifice. You need an innocent sacrifice, and that's the only way that you're going to be redeemed from your law-breaking. But the law didn't provide that. So it brought slavery. Next point. The law was for Hagar's kids and brought slavery. Now here's really where we get to our application port, portion of the lesson. Why, oh why, would Isaac's children, children for freedom, you and me, why would we want to go back to the Old Testament law to justify the practices of whatever we're trying to justify. One of the things I'm talking about is instrumental music. I won't rehash our discussion that Ryan and I had up here a few months ago, but 99% of the time, any time that somebody tries to make a scriptural argument for instrumental music, it's always going back to the Old Testament. But that was for Hagar's kids. And it brought slavery, that covenant did. Why are we so willing to go back to it and get what we want to get? How about this one? Fascination with Israel. And by that I mean the physical Israel. And Gaza Strip and the Muslims coming in and destroying uh, physical Jerusalem. We even call that land still the Holy Land. Why do we call it that? Why do we call it that? Does God cause His name to, to dwell in Jerusalem anymore? Does God dwell in a temple there? God causes His name to dwell in the church. You want to be fascinated with anything? Be fascinated with God's church. He dwells in the church, not a temple. Unless you're talking about us being the temple. And so we're fascinated still in our country 
has all kinds of political motives to, to keep them clean. And I understand that they're, they're our friends and whatnot. But I think there's so many religious misconceptions that are involved in that. It's not the land of promise anymore. And a lot of cool things happen there. And a lot of holy things happen there. It's not the holy land. There's only ones that are holy on earth. And that's the church of Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments. How many times have you heard people get upset about the Ten Commandments being taken down off of a, a court building? Take them all down! I think it breeds a lot more misconceptions among people who don't really know the Bible. Take them all down! We are not under the Ten Commandments. And every time I think that the church understands that, I run into another Christian who thinks that we are under the Ten Commandments. We are not. Unless you see that commandment reiterated in the New Covenant. And I don't know why I separated this one, because this one is really part of the Ten Commandments, and that being the Sabbath. But all the Sabbath day heresies that are out there are all rooted in Old Testament stuff. We're not under that. That was for Hagar's kids. It brought slavery. Why would we want to go back to it? You know who doesn't understand this? or where you hear this misconception a lot about the difference between the Old and New Covenants is in the atheism realm and the gay and lesbian community. I can't tell you how many times I've seen in an article or a blog or in an interview or just people acting it out on TV where somebody says all those Bible believers are total hypocrites anyway because they don't follow the Bible. They don't stone people who don't keep the Sabbath. You ever heard that? All those Christian believers, they love their bacon. They're eating their pork. Yeah, I, lo I love bacon. And I ain't stopping eating it. Don't quote me from the Old Testament like you know the Bible. But do we know our Bibles? And can we logically run through some of these arguments that that was for Hagar's children it brought slavery, and we're not going back to it to justify any of our promises or practices. Excuse me. So is the Old Testament worthless? You may expect me to put up a big no. But it's a big yes. In regards to making people righteous, that is. And when I say worthless, I'm quoting from the Bible. Stay here in Galatians, but turn over to Galatians chapter 4 and read with me verses 9 and 10. At least the English Standard Version uses the word worthless in regards to Old Testament practices. Verse 9 of chapter 4, But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? If you're not convinced that he's talking about the Old Testament, first of all, he says, whose slaves you want to be. Well, chapter 3 said, what about slavery? The Old Testament law. So I'm convinced just by that question, or just by verse 9, that he's talking about Old Testament law. But verse 10 is really the kicker. Look at verse 10. You observe days and months and seasons and years. He's not talking about keeping a calendar at work. When he talks about days and months and seasons and years, he's talking about the religious holidays that the Old Testament prescribed. And he calls them worthless in verse 9. Skip over to chapter 5, and you'll see him talk about circumcision. And you know what he's going to say about circumcision? It's completely worthless. It doesn't count for a thing. Look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. In regards to make, being right with God, knowing how to worship, knowing what kind of people to be. No, I don't shy away from this word. It's completely worthless. But in regards to teaching principles and encouragement and getting to know God, yes, there is value. It's not completely worthless. I won't go over and read this passage, but 1 Peter chapter 1, 
Just write it down if you're taking notes. Verses 10 through 12, we normally go to this 1 Peter 1 passage to talk about the inspiration of the Scripture because it talks about the prophets being inspired by God and they don't know what they're even prophesying about. They were inquiring what time and what person the Spirit was, was telling them what was going to happen. Well, in verse 12 of chapter 1, it says that the Spirit informed the prophets that they were not serving themselves, but you. The prophets of the Old Testament, in a way, were serving the church. Telling us who Christ is. Because there's some prophecies that really nail down that Jesus of Nazareth, and I'm sure Ryan is going to get into this in his Old Testament, Christ in the Old Testament class, it really nails down that only Jesus of Nazareth could have been the Christ. There's several things that are good and wholesome about the Old Testament. But in regards, just so I make myself clear once again, in regards to being righteous or right with God, it's worthless. And that includes the Ten Commandments. So now this question. Why did God implement it? If, if God knew that that system of law was not going to justify anybody, and God knew that it was temporary and that it was only for the Jews, and that everybody was going to live under Christ and His law at some point, why did it even come about? Well, go back to chapter 3 of Galatians. Because fortunately, Paul actually asked this question. He says in verse 19, here's our question, why then the law? Right? Here it is. And there's two answers, I believe, in the text. It was added because of transgressions. I want to stop there. I know that's the middle of the verse. It was added because of transgressions. I think what Paul is saying here, based on what I think Paul is saying in Romans... That what God did in the law is He highlighted sin. He made it clear that of mankind's inability to save themselves by keeping a list of rules and regulations and laws. And the reason I believe that is because Paul says in, in, in the book of Romans that without, trans, without law, there is no transgression. Listen to that. Without law, there is no transgression. So what God did in giving them millions of laws, practically is shining a light of how much they were breaking that. Now you might wonder, what in the world is that picture on the right? It's a sofa. That's right. Really cluttered sofa. That's not my sofa. That's probably what it looks like with no cushions on it. Have you ever cleaned your house and you thought it was clean and then you lifted up the couch? or lifted the cushions off of the couch and you find crumbs down there, coins, all kinds of treasures down there. You thought your house was clean, right? Now, Ryan Goodwin, in his way of cleaning, he probably cleans under his couch. But most people don't, right? Most people don't clean on the backside of their fridge. You ever pulled your fridge away from the wall and see how nasty that is? Well, essentially what God did in the old law, listen, you think you're good? You think you're righteous? You think you can do it? And he pulls the fridge away from our lives. Pulls up the couch. And we get to see how nasty and filthy we are. And how much we need grace. A second reason that God implemented the law. Drop down to verse 24. Verse 24 of chapter 3. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. I'm going to put up this term. I found this in an article recently. Parental guardian. I know some of the passages uh, translate it tutor or schoolmaster. This one, guardian. The way this term is used in the Greek, it was used as parental guardians from time to time in that language of that day. Parental guardian. Think about what we do as parents. Do we just highlight the bad in our kids? Do we just highlight their violations and their transgressions? I'm sure some ungodly parents do. But that's not the goal of parents, right? We don't just highlight the bads. We highlight what's good. We tell them what's good. And the law did that. It didn't just highlight that they were sinners. 
It highlighted what God wanted. That God wanted to be worshipped and extolled. And God wanted us to put our arm around a stranger and, and lift up the widow and the fatherless. It points to what's right also. So that when Christ came, we would see right in the flesh. And they would be able to recognize it. That's what God wants right there in Jesus. Now, sticking along this line with kids, I have one last comparison or contrast that is in the text in regards to the Old and New Covenant. And this is really why I even wanted to preach the lesson. This is a discovery that I made about some of the language that is used here. There's going to be a term in the Greek and really in the English too, in Galatians 3 and Galatians chapter 4, that distinguish a mature son or daughter versus a baby or a toddler. Look first at the term son or sons. Look down at verse 26. For in Christ, chapter 3 that is, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. And this term son, if you skip over one chapter to chapter 4, verse 5, it says that he wanted to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. This Greek term is eos. It has reference to mature children, like I am an eos now to my parents. Uh, Greg is an eos to his parents. Austin is an eos to his parents. We're grown. We're mature. Are we still their kids? Yes. But we're grown and mature, right? Well, we have different words for babies and toddlers, like babies and toddlers and infants. And in the Greek, they did too. And that word is nepios. Nepios. And that had reference to a baby or a toddler. Now listen to this. In regards to how God was treating the people in the Old Testament, guess what Greek word Paul uses? It's not eos, it's nepios. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, see that word child? That's nepios. As long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Verse 2. But he is under guardians. Where did we see that term? He's under guardians. He's under the old law. Can I read it like that, please? He's under the old law until the date set by his father. Verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were nepios, when we were children, were enslaved. What enslaves? The Old Testament law. What God was doing with human, humanity, and, and, and the Israelites in particular, was He was treating them like a baby or a toddler. But in Christ Jesus, He wants you to be a mature son or daughter. Listen to me. You know what we do with our babies and toddlers? You have to micromanage them. We tell them what to wear. We tell them what to eat. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't touch this. Touch that. What time to go to bed. You micromanage a baby or a toddler because that's what they need, right? And that's what humanity needed at the time. But just like our parental experience, it's not the goal to treat your child like a baby forever, right? It's not the goal for you to be treating them when they're 21 like a, like a toddler. My sister turned 21 today. My baby sister, the youngest of us six. What would you think of my parents if they bought her a pacifier? 21-year-old kid. There comes a time and the scripture says the date set by the Father. Where you send them out the house and you give them what? Freedom. And you don't micromanage them. You don't tell them when to go to bed and what to wear and what to eat. You give them freedom, but you expect them to make the right call and the right decisions because of the training that you gave them. And when the right time came, and what time was that? The fullness of time. When the fullness of time came, God started treating mankind not like an epios, but like an eos, when he sent his only eos. Every time the Bible uses the term son of God, it is the eos of God. 
so that we might be Eos too. And thus treated like it. You want to go back to the old law where they're treated like babies and toddlers and told what to eat? No, not me. I enjoy the freedom that's in Jesus Christ. Not just freedom from sin, but freedom from being micromanaged. Please get out your songbook and turn to the song of invitation. You know, the problem with us is that sometimes, even though God is treating us like Eos, we want to act like Nepios. We want to act like we're babies and toddlers. We act like we still want a bottle. Come out of that. Grow. And I know that our new Christians aren't going to immediately be mature. I, I get that. But God is going to immediately treat you like a son, like a mature daughter. And the goal now, after being baptized, is to mature and to mature and to mature and to live up to what God wants you to be. Which is conform to the image of of his eos, the Son of God. The waters behind me are ready. If you've never been baptized, you can be baptized into Christ and forgiven of your sin and walk out of here an eos of God. Will you come? As together we stand and sing.